We have uh, Pranoy, if I may, we have Seema Sirohi joining us uh, from New York. Uh, she's columnist for the Economic Times. But let's start with Christine Emba is also here with us, uh, opinion columnist, uh, the Washington Post from Washington, D.C. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining us. Uh, Christine, uh, <laughs> turning out to be a real cliffhanger, not quite as many of the polls projected a comfortable lead for Biden. What is your take on what's going on? And if indeed it appears to be that Trump has the edge, how would you explain it? Well, right now it's pretty early in the game, frankly, uh, and it's actually also hard to explain. Um, the difficulty with the race this year is that a mixture of results coming in at a variety of times. Certain states are reporting first their electoral totals that they have received from in-person voting today, while they're still counting the overwhelming number of mail-in ballots that came over the past several weeks. Other states are doing the process in reverse. They've counted most of their mail-in ballots and are still tabulating the results from uh, active visits to the polls today. So unfortunately, while I think many of us had hoped that there would be a Biden landslide or at least a decisive lead early in the night, it looks like we may end up waiting through the night and to the next day or even longer as the results are tabulated from all corners uh, before we can actually say something definitive about who's winning. Phone pick, you are scanned. Okay. Uh, Seema Sirohi, uh, what's your uh, take? Again, I know a lot of caveats. It's still early days and all of that. But would you like to take a shot at explaining how Trump has managed, I mean, perhaps we're not talking of victory yet, but how he's managed to narrow what initially was a substantial lead between Biden and him up until June, July. The lead was much wider, and it's just come right down to the wire uh, just as America went out to vote. Yes, I think uh, he's doing better than expected because all the polls, as you said, showed a comfortable lead for Joe Biden. But I think what changed was the frantic campaigning that uh, he undertook, where thousands upon thousands of people showed up, uh, you know, with no care about the pandemic, et cetera. Uh, and there was a lot of enthusiasm on the ground. It was really palpable. And he was going to places where, uh, you know, factories have closed down, where you know, jobs have been lost. And he talked about the economy, and he talked about the fact that if you vote for Joe Biden, it's going to be so uh, socialism. You know, so he was able to flip the narrative somewhat. And I think that's what you're seeing. Uh, then there's this question of the shy Trump voter. I quite believe sure. that to be the case because, you know, it's just not acceptable today in American society, in polite American society, to say that you might vote for Trump um, because then they think you are like, uh, quote unquote, deplorable. So uh, lots and lots of people are not telling the pollsters. So the two polls that sure. had 2016 right are the ones uh, that uh, that are predicting that uh, Trump might come back from behind and win again. Right. Uh, uh, Christine, uh, is, could that have been one of the factors that, uh, you know, that Seema spoke about, that towards the end, Trump went on this... Uh, you know, very, very aggressive campaign, even though he just recovered from the coronavirus. He was all over the place, particularly hitting battleground states. And Joe Biden was still being uh, fairly cautious about getting out there. Could that have, uh, could that be one of the factors? I mean, that could definitely be a factor. We really did see Trump uh, barnstorming across the United States over the past 10 to 15 days. That said, one of the questionable things about this sort of last spurt of campaigning was that many of the sites that he went to were actually sites that should have been considered safe for him in the past, which bespoke some level of fear. Um, again, I think that's a great point, though, about the shy Trump voter. Uh, you're right, Seema, that there is 
on some level uh, a bit of disapproval from at least uh, perhaps what Trump voters might call elites uh, for admitting that you're a Trump voter. But I think that one of the you know enduring questions about the American electoral system and tracking it right now is how polls operate. Uh, polls can only be so granular. You have to invest a lot of money to make them more targeted. One of the things that we've seen in mm. states like Florida, Arizona, and Texas is actually that polls may have underestimated the amount of Latino support for Trump uh, and his support among other minorities. Again, more careful targeting might have identified this, uh, but if things, you know, turn out uh, unexpectedly, one of the big questions from this election will be, how did we miss these people again? Well, okay. I think. And Christine, last, absolutely, very last quick question uh, before we let you go and we have to go into a break is, uh, you know, in the event that we're looking at Trump 2.0, and I know there's still very early doors yet, um, what does that mean, particularly for the very fraught nature of race equations in America right now? I think it becomes even more fraught, unfortunately. I think that if uh, Trump does win a second term, it will be seen rather justifiably as an assertion of truth, the fact that his narrative of racial strife, of disharmony, of two sides fighting against each other is actually one that's shared by perhaps a majority of the American population. That, in fact, that sense of fear and perhaps even some level of ethno-nationalism is a majority held view in the United States. We might have thought that we had progressed past that. And if we haven't, that will be something alarming sure. and fearful that we will have to reckon with over the next four years. 